Are there many more out there, Alicia? Uh, no, uh, you're good at that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who I'm sure most people here will already know, Dr. Bob Hazen, who's been here for quite a few years, both at GL and then at uh, EPL. Bob did his uh, bachelor's in earth science at MIT and then PhD at Harvard. Um, spent a brief period of time in Cambridge in the UK before moving here as a postdoc and then as a staff scientist. He's received numerous awards over the years, including recently elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and received the International Mineralogical Association Medal of Excellence. And Bob's going to talk to us today about an evolutionary system of mineralogy, a mineral informatics approach. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to be able to describe some of our recent work in mineralogy, a field that I love. And I've worked here at the Carnegie Institution for 46 years studying minerals in one way or another. Think about minerals singly and also in combination. They're absolutely the oldest things you can hold in your hand. Minerals tell the story of the origin of planets, the origin of life. And every mineral is so information rich. It's a time capsule just waiting to be open, waiting to tell its story. Mineral specimens have huge numbers of information rich attributes. That's why they so lend themselves to an informatics approach. Think about it. There are dozens of trace and minor elements, scores of stable isotopes. We have structural defects, twinning, zoning, um, exolution of various sorts. We have solid and fluid inclusions. All the physical and chemical properties, optical, magnetic, elastic properties. The sizes and shapes of minerals are information in themselves, and also their petrologic context and much more. So the whole point of this talk is that mineral informatics exploits this inherent multidimensionality of minerals. It's that data that helps us make discoveries. So what I want to do is just very briefly introduce this idea of mineral informatics. I want to present three use cases and then spend most of the time on this new evolutionary system of mineral classification, which uses the informatics approach. So the strategy is really simple. You start by characterizing samples. They could be natural or experimental. If we applied this to astronomy, they could be observations of stars or observations of exoplanets. You then go through a process of datification, basically building a data object. And this is often the most time consuming part of informatics. And then you apply powerful analytical and visualization techniques. So the three use cases I want to look at have to do with, first, can we improve the Garnet geobarometer? Can we estimate Earth's atmospheric oxygen through deep time? And can we predict mineral occurrences? So the first of these, it's a recurrent challenge in the Earth sciences to determine the depth of formation of a sample, the pressure at which it formed. And so you look at this beautiful crystal of a diamond with a garnet inclusion, and you ask, is there any way this sample can reveal to us the pressure at which that diamond formed or which the garnet crystal formed? And indeed, garnet turns out to be an ideal case to do this. Now, the ideal high pressure garnet called pyrope is a magnesium aluminum silicate. It has three different sites in the crystal structure. It has a tetrahedral site in which a silicon atom is surrounded by four oxygens. It has an octahedral site in which ideally the aluminum is surrounded by six oxygens, and then a eight coordinated site, a dodecahedral site in which magnesium is surrounded by eight oxygens. But if all pyropes were ideal, you couldn't use it as a geoparameter. The thing that is so great is that it has all these compositional variations. In the octahedral site, you can have iron, chromium, titanium, even silicon. And in the eight coordinated site, magnesium, iron, sodium, calcium, manganese, all those compositional variables adjust to the pressure of formation and therefore can reveal what's going on. So there's a paper that came out last year. I'm not a co-author in this. I followed it closely. Uh, Co-authors include Anirudh Prabhu and Mike Walter, in which they proposed a new garnet geobarometer using machine learning. So here's how this works. 
you see the garnets, when you get above about seven GPA, that's 700,000, excuse me, 70,000 atmospheres or about 200 kilometers depth. Then you can start putting some of the silicon from the four coordinated site, you can add even more silicon and put it in the six coordinated site. And there's a couple of substitutions, the majorite substitution in which two aluminums are replaced by a magnesium and a silicon. There's also a sodium majorite substitution in which a magnesium and aluminum are replaced by a sodium and a silicon. So you're adding more and more silicon into the structure. And that can be a basis for a geobarometer. And a lot of people have tried this going back to 2010. These are four different geobarometers that were proposed. They all use linear regression models from three to seven elements. And you can see the scatter is pretty significant, resulting in scatters about plus or minus 10 GPA on these plots. But still, there is a general trend. Now, what was this proposed by Thompson et al. in this 2001 paper is you can use experimental data where you know the pressure and you have nine compositional variables. You then use random subsets, so like 70% of the sample, and you use that as a, as a training set, and then you test the remaining 30 and you do this a thousand times. You keep running this cycle over and over again, and you get statistical results that give you a new pressure composition relationship. Here's what the data set. So remember I said, that's a lot of the work. So compiling 519 experimental data with lots and lots of parameters, but you see that the nine different compositional variables here, and here's the resulting improved set. This is using machine learning. And here with plus or minus two GPA errors, this is a really significant advance. Now, this is, I think, only the first step as we get more and more data, as we apply even more advanced machine learning techniques, perhaps the errors can be reduced even more. But you see this dramatic change by just using previously published data. Sorry, can you just quickly, yeah. why, is just my, why is machine learning better than just doing... Uh, it doesn't use linear regression. It uses higher dimensional regressions. It also allows you to sample the subsets in various ways, because some of the data may be um, more constraining of the line than the others. And I will let, I think Anirudh Prabhu should probably give us a tutorial on machine learning, because this is, this is a, oh, I'll, I'll give you another example of machine learning now. And I think you'll see the kinds of things we can do. So the second use case is trying to predict the atmospheric oxygen through four and a half billion years of Earth's history. This is something that's been a major concern in astrobiology and geobiology. Here, for example, is Tim Lyons' 2014 summary of work on atmospheric oxygenation over the last 4 billion years. And you'll see a series of trends, very, very low before about 3 billion years, maybe whiffs of oxygen between 3 and 2.5, great oxygenation event, 2.5 to 2.2, a long period where it's not very well constrained what happened, then another rise in atmospheric oxygen called the Neoproterozoic oxygenation event. And the last 500 million years when oxygen has been more or less at the present level, but with some very significant fluctuations. Now, the question we've asked is, can you use minerals to better constrain this? Because many minerals are oxygen sensitive, they're redox sensitive. So fortunately, over the last 12 years, we've built a huge data resource this is based on the rough platform. This is the list of all the IMA approved minerals, more than 5,800 of them so far. You can select on the order of composition. And we have built this evolution data set, which now has over 200,000 mineral locality age data. So you can click on your favorite element and find what minerals formed at what times. In our particular case, we've sorted on manganese. You click on manganese, you export to evolution, and it gives you this data set, 6,500 manganese minerals with known oxidation state and known dates. Now, manganese minerals come in three different flavors in terms of oxidation states, plus two, plus three, and plus four. And so the ratio of these changes through geological history, and they could reveal something about oxygen in the atmosphere. Other people like Dan Hummer have done this, but in a paper that's just now submitted to Nature, in review, this is the machine learning approach to this effort. So my colleagues at Beijing University compiled this data set. They 
the 6,500 that came from the mineral evolution database. They then took each of those 6,500 occurrences and it tabulated additional attributes. So not only the oxidation states of the manganese, but also the oxidation states of other elements that were present, this mineral species that were present, the structural crystallographic parameters, perhaps some tectonic information of the localities. So 25 different attributes, some of which may not seem to be related to oxygen at all, but you use all of them. You train the model by identifying periods of time when the oxygen in the atmosphere is pretty well constrained. So that's, that's the training set. And then you apply machine learning to the whole 6,500 to come up with a new model. Here is the model that Lee et al. have proposed. And it's really quite remarkable. This goes back 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion years. And you see the exact same trends we saw before with the lion model, but there's some new details. So here they are lined up. What Lee et al. are finding is based on manganese minerals, there's actually some degree of increased oxygenation between 3.5 and 3 billion years. You see the great oxidation event. You see a period where it really looks quite stable, but the value is quite constrained. And then there's other bumps and wiggles, which are details which have not been seen in other models. Now, this is still in review. It has not been demonstrated, but the potential here for using minerals is huge. And I don't mean just this manganese set, but think of all the redox sensitive elements, first row transition elements. You have cobalt, nickel, copper, iron. You have uranium, you have arsenic and sulfur. And if you start using all of those elements, we have more than 100,000 mineral locality age couples. And for each of those localities, you could have a whole string of attributes and apply these same machine learning techniques. So this may be a more sensitive, a more refined approach to determining Earth's atmospheric oxygen history. Because remember, minerals preserve that information over billions of years. So of course, growth of any, any of these depends on all the, just going back to the mineral and, and how it originally formed, it depends on pressure, temperature, you know, all these other parameters. So how does that, play? now you're just pointing out one parameter. So, so Eric's point is that there are many, many attributes of minerals that could influence the formation and oxygen is just one of them. And one of the things that's amazing about machine learning and using dozens of attributes at once is no one of those attributes is gonna tell you what the oxygen is, but you take them collectively and you train it, you may suddenly find higher dimensional uh, correlations, which your mind just can't see, but it's the collective. So perhaps it's the fact that uranium coexists with chromium and that changes through time. Perhaps it's something to do with a tectonic setting. Perhaps there may be some other attribute that we haven't thought of yet. But when you start building these data sets, you let the data tell you if there's a strong correlation or not. And that's what's coming out of this plot. Hi. If you train on natural samples, which I guess is what we're set here, the data, how does that so you've trained on, on natural samples that have been dated some other way or that have known oxygen. Yeah. So you've already sort of taken um, into your correlation whatever previous oxygen mineral models have been done, right? So you could instead train on experimental data where you control yeah. the, the redox. And you know, is, has there been any attempt to compare what you get to a control? This is absolutely this is brand it. new. So, so this is a great point. What do you train on? There are numerous machine learning approaches and models. And this isn't just one size fits all. So the number of attributes you select, the way you do that, and the way you ask your questions affects the way you use machine learning. Just like in any scientific, any experimental approach, you might use this experimental approach or that experimental approach. In this case, machine learning is a toolkit that allows us to look for correlations amongst higher dimensional data. Yeah, no, I totally get that. It's just that since you need to calibrate on something in the natural samples, you already have built into the yeah. oxygen mineral relationship some sort of right. model of O2 that you're then training on. Exactly, and you have to do that. You have to make some assumptions, but then you can bootstrap. So in this case, 
We certainly can train on recent history. There are a lot of manganese deposits from the last million years where we have ice core data with very accurate oxygen atmospheric levels. We also have very strong evidence for what was happening at this point. We have very strong evidence for what the value should be here. And a few other assumptions can be made about constraints. But the more we learn, the more we can constrain the model and feed back on itself. So as I say, this is very, very preliminary. It's the first time anyone's ever tried this. But the fact that we can come up with a graph that looks remarkably like what people have said in the past, I think is astonishing. Can I pick up on that point? Sure. I don't find it astonishing at all because you're basically using the same data for your calibration. So if you don't get the same results, then there's a big problem. If you get the same results, uh, it, it seems to me there's no great insight. Well, it's astonishing because we only used a few data points and a few spots to pin the graph. But those are the key points in, the, in that but graph. But what about this? What about the fact <clears throat> that you're seeing an oxygenation of some sort reflected in the oxidation state of these manganese minerals long before other models have suggested that? It's because they don't have, they don't have any samples from that earlier period, but we do because minerals allow, give us a broader time range. Well, I guess my next question is how, in the, in the data set you're using, how do you make, make sure that what your, uh, the minerals you're looking for have a, have a sort of an unmodified record of when they ah. formed? Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> It seems to me if you have a huge data set, it's very difficult to tell whether the whether a mineral has been reset, uh, either it's time or it's valence. Right. So this is one of the astonishing things about using large data sets. Unless every data point in the data set is wrong, if 90% of them are accurate and 10% are wrong, with machine learning models, you actually come up with statistically significant results. So virtually every data set has some errors. Sometimes it's just you copied a number down wrong or someone reported an experimental value wrong or they did the experiment badly. For example, that Garnet data set, I'm sure Mike would tell you that of those 519 data, you know, these are 20 values that I really don't trust. But if you put them all in and you use the statistical average, then you see the correlations that are at a much higher level than any one data point. Um, say some of this for the Q&A. I guess the last question I think is critical. So, so is, is, are you saying the manganese was in, in, are you saying the manganese was in equilibrium with the atmosphere? I mean, in all these uh, deposits? That is, that assumption is not being made here. What's being asked is, is the distribution of these manganese minerals and other minerals and elements in some way show a strong correlation to what we know about atmospheric oxygen and therefore, you can take the fact that we have 6,500 data points that go back even farther in time and see if the overall trend is there. So I honestly, I mean, I'm really shocked in some ways because some of those manganese minerals were formed deeper underground where the redox state is not in equilibrium with the atmosphere. Some of these manganese minerals have probably altered through time. But whatever happened to those manganese minerals, they still preserve some higher dimensional record of what the, and that's the key with data, this kind of approach to machine learning. No one variable is going to give you the answer. No X, Y plot will tell you what's going on. But when you have 25 attributes, somehow the higher dimensional combination of those is giving you information that's preserving something about Earth's history. It's hard to get your mind around it. I found this hard to accept at first when I first start doing this, but when you start seeing it working over and over and over again, you know, nine compositional dimensions in a, in a garnet geobarometer where you can't write down the equation of what exactly, it's not a linear equation of coefficients for each of those nine compositional variables. It's, it's some higher dimensional thing that, that your mind is not going to be able to easily comprehend. And yet, nevertheless, you come up with a much better correlation. Let me tell you about a third case, predicting mineral occurrences. And I think this has been a huge challenge in mineralogy. The, the old expression, gold is where you find it, as opposed to, can we predict specific locations of ore 
minerals or, or other minerals. And the great benefit here is that once again, we have a huge data resource, MINDAT, in this case, over 300,000 mineral localities, over 1.2 million locality mineral pairs. And each one of those localities, you'll have a group of coexisting minerals. So when you think about it, what this means is ultimately we have tens of millions of mineral association pairs, which is what you're required to apply the power of association analysis. So association analysis is a recommender system. This is what you use when you're buying a book on Amazon and they come back instantaneously say, oh, well, you should also consider these books because they know if people like books X, Y, and Z, then they're likely to like book A as well. Or if you didn't like some book that tells them not to recommend another book. So these are recommender systems. And you can do the same thing with minerals. You basically can ask questions like, where can I find a locality of a specific mineral? Um, where we, can we find analog sites, for example, for Mars analog sites based on a limited amount of mineral information? Or if there's a new site that has a few minerals, what do we think the whole mineral inventory is gonna be? You basically set up a, a group of, uh, of correlations and this can be two, three, four minerals that occur together and the probability that a, another mineral that has not yet been found in that locality exists. Now, this has been applied by um, Shona Morrison and Anirudh Prabhu uh, for specifically for looking for critical mineral resources, rare earth element resources, uh, lithium minerals. And you have various association rules with a high probability. So this is for uh, looking for the rare earth element mineral monazite and successful predictions. They had not been seen at these localities. People have gone to the localities and found the minerals. Here's the case of lithium minerals, uh, the mineral spodumene. The minerals that are used in the recommender are not lithium minerals. So in this case, beryl is a beryllium silicate. There's a calcium iron phosphate and iron sulfide. And yet the discovery of phosphate has also, of, of spodumene has also been made. So this is another example. And once again, this is just absolute beginning. All of these approaches have been tackled in the last two and a half years. So we're right at the beginning. Now recommender systems can be expanded greatly rather than using three or four minerals as your association rule. You could imagine in the future having much larger computer resources and doing uh, 10 or 20 minerals and having much more accurate predictions. Also, rather than just using minerals, you could use all sorts of things. You could use vegetation, you could use climate zones, uh, you could use microbial communities as part of your association rules. So these don't have to just be minerals. So this is just the very first step again. So what I've shown you so far with the geobarometer, with the, re, the modeling of Earth's atmospheric oxidation and this recommender system trying to predict mineral localities is if you take multi-dimensional data sets, you can start analyzing them and processing them in ways you can't just do when you have a simple XY plot. And these higher dimensional systems are often very hard for you to comprehend. You look at the result and say, well, where did that come from? And you won't always know right away but it's still the correlations are buried in these higher dimensional systems. So what I wanna do is now talk about what's been my passion for the last several years. And this is asking questions about Earth's mineralogy through deep time. So these whole set of questions have sort of driven me since 2008. How has Earth's near surface mineralogy changed? What processes contribute most to Earth's mineral diversity? When do those processes occur? Or what ways do Earth's minerals differ from those of other planets and moons? And also about the co-evolution of minerals and life, which is a theme in mineral evolution. And if you're gonna answer these questions, you need to think about minerals in the context of deep time. That's why we need a new classification system. So think about the objectives of a classification system. It's pretty obvious. The first thing is just to communicate. If I'm gonna to talk to you about calcite or quartz or diamond, you need to know what I'm talking about. But in a deeper level, classification systems should somehow inform theory. They should somehow play a critical role in the discovery and articulation of new ideas and, and make discoveries. And so in this context, multiple schemes, classification schemes are permissible. 
So IMA, the International Mineralogical Association, it has three criteria for minerals. You have to be a naturally occurring solid. You have to have an idealized chemical composition based on the end member composition of major elements. And you have to have an idealized crystal structure. So here's quartz, it's SiO2 in the quartz structure. That's one species. There are 5,800 plus approved species, each with a unique combination of structure and chemistry. In other words, the IMA protocols use the absolute minimum number of bits of information to define species. So it's an incredibly useful system. It's very streamlined. It allows us to communicate efficiently. It allows new minerals to be named unambiguously in most cases. The thing is, that if we wanna understand Earth through deep time, we need to embrace all the other information rich attributes of minerals. And the IMA system doesn't do that. So why do we need a new system? I think it's because we wanna understand minerals through deep time. All of these ideas began in a paper from 2008 called Mineral Evolution. The idea of that, that Earth's mineralogy changed through time as a result of new processes, physical processes, chemical processes, ultimately biological processes. And we talked about 10 stages of mineral evolution. Now, a week from Thursday, I'm gonna be giving a neighborhood lecture. I'll go into more details about this, but basically you can describe this in a very qualitative way. You can talk about the stages of mineral evolution and see the diversification occurring over billions of years. We can do various things. Here's a plot of manganese minerals that Dan Hummer did, going back from modern time, back four billion years. You see epicidicity in manganese minerals. You see also changes in the oxidation state of manganese minerals. You can plot these data in various ways. It's a skyline diagram of all the first row transition elements, each one showing both the distribution through time and the oxidation states. A huge amount of information here. You can compare and contrast different time periods and different elements. We can do this for all the elements. This is on our website where you can just click on your favorite element and find how the minerals bearing that element have changed through time. And we can do other tricks. For example, we collaborate with our colleagues at University of Sydney, where they've designed a G plate platform with plate reconstructions going back a billion years. And here we can do this. This is a plot showing the occurrence of manganese minerals over the last 500 million years or so. The time is up in the corner and you'll start seeing continents come together. And what you see amongst other things is that most manganese mineralization, indeed most mineralization on earth occurs at peaks during times of supercontinent assembly. So you'll see most of the mineral, most of the red dots here corresponding to new manganese mineral localities occur at or near plate boundaries. And most of them occurred during times of that supercontinent assembly. You see here's Pangaea about 200 million years ago and so forth. So these are all ways that we can study the distribution and diversity of minerals through time. And what we do, once again, we're exploiting these large data resources in mineralogy. And this is for what I've been using to develop an evolutionary system. So remember the IMA system, naturally occurring. You have to have an idealized chemical composition and idealized structure. What we propose now is we're gonna split some IMA species into more than one kind. We're going to lump some IMA species into a single kind. And we're also going to recognize amorphous materials as being important. So let's just take an example of diamond. Here's a, a stellar diamond, stardust. This forms in the atmosphere of an old carbon rich star. The diamonds condense at a high temperature, but a low pressure. That's distinct from a type one diamond, which occurs from the mantle from an aqueous fluid that's saturated in carbon. It's distinct from type two diamonds, which appear to occur in a metal satur saturated with carbon. There's impact diamonds, which occurs when you have a, a, an asteroid strike on a carbon rich horizon. And then there's this stuff called carbonato, which is a kind of diamond. That I don't think anybody has a definitive answer of how this forms, but here's at least five different kinds of diamond. Same thing's true for apatite. It can be found in meteorites in small masses. It can be found in big, beautiful crystals and pegmatites but it's also the mineral of your teeth and your bones. And I would argue that these are different kinds of appetite. The record for the most number of kinds that we've identified is pyrite, iron sulfide, that we have 21 different kinds identified so far, some from high temperature, some from low temperature, some with aqueous fluids, some with sulfide rich fluids. Some of them are abiotic, but some of them are microbially 
induced, so they're biological. And if we find pyrite on Mars, the first question I would ask is, what kind of pyrite? Now, in other cases, we lump things. Tourmaline is an interesting example. There's 37 different approved species of tourmaline, and they're the result of very small differences in ratios of elements. If you have a little more magnesium, it's one species, a little more iron, it's another species, for example. And one of these colorful crystals can have as many as seven different IMA approved species in a single crystal. We say it's one natural kind. And this goes down even to the microscopic scale. Ed Grew found these uh, metamorphic tourmalines in the sewer. The core is an iron rich variety called shoral. The rim is a magnesium rich dravite. We think that that's one natural kind. And then finally, we include amorphous materials in this system obsidian, for example, coal, uh, limonite, pyrolusite, all things included in the 19th century before x ray diffraction. But when x ray diffraction came along, these don't diffract very well. So, so you don't include them in the IMA system. But we think they're really important. Um, and Mars, Sean Morris and I are both on the Chemin team where we found that in some samples, 50% to 70% of the sample is amorphous material. If you don't include that material as part of your mineral inventory, you're really not gonna be able to understand the history of the planet and how the surface evolved. So we have developed this, two papers that came out July 1st of this year, one on the paragenetic modes of minerals, that's the way minerals form, the second on lumping and splitting. What we basically did is list 5,700 minerals, each one a separate row. We have 60 different forms of form modes of formation, each a separate column. And you look, each mineral is formed in one or more ways. There are about 10,500 different ways that minerals are observed to form. This, is what, by the way, is about six months worth of intense work during COVID isolation, building this data resource. So this led us to the evolutionary system in mineralogy. Basically, we, we group an IMA mineral like graphite with a mode of formation. In this first case, stellar minerals. This is a type two supernova, distinguished from moissanite silicon carbide formed in an AGB type star. Okay, so you can show this in a network diagram. This is called a bipartite network in which the star-shaped modes are different kinds of stars and the diamond-shaped modes are different kinds of minerals and each mineral is linked to one or more star and each star is linked to one or more minerals in this part one of our series. I wanna take a little bit of a side to talk about cluster analysis because this is ultimately how we want to do this in a rigorous way. We can't do it for most minerals yet, but we can do it for silicon carbide thanks to heroic work by other people. So cluster analysis basically takes lots and lots of specimens and see how they're distributed in multi-dimensional composition space. Take meteorites, you dissolve them in acid, you extract the silicon carbide grains, the moissanite grains. And people like Larry Nittler have spent a significant amount of their career, also colleagues at Wash University in St. Louis and University of Chicago, building a database, in this case, 17,000 analyses of silicon carbide. And those analyses are isotope ratios, silicon isotopes, carbon isotopes, nitrogen isotopes, aluminum isotopes. Now, in Larry's paper from 2016, they did a, just a two-dimensional plot, but these are higher dimensional systems. And we have at least, we have a lot of data for at least five different isotope ratios. So Asma Bouyabar did um, this initial study in which she included five different compositional attributes, isotope ratios, and did cluster analysis in five dimensions and additional work which used other cluster techniques because this is, again, it's a whole constellation of techniques um, led by Greta Heisted. Basically, the conclusion here is that there appeared to be seven dominant clusters of silicon carbide grains, several of which are associated with different stages of evolution of AGB stars. So there's a lot of astrophysics buried in here. Um, and that's what we want to do with every mineral species down the road, you know, high pressure garnets and feldspars and pyroxenes and so forth. That's an aspiration. Anyway, let's move on. Part two, this is interstellar and solar nebular minerals. We can expand that graph you saw before. These are the uh, primary solar condensates, for example, in CAIs. We can add interstellar clouds and the ices that occur at very, very cold temperatures. Part three is the chondrial minerals. These are the first igneous rocks in our solar system. About 90 different minerals shown here. 
We can expand that and include the planetesimal minerals, the differentiated core and mantles, the impact minerals, thermal alteration, aqueous alteration. You see that things keep expanding. So these are all the minerals that are known from meteorites, about 300 species in all. That's kind of a baseline for any terrestrial planet or moon in our solar system. We can expand it farther by speculating on the minerals that might have occurred in the earliest Hadean crust. And this diagram, we've colored this so that in red are minerals that occur only in meteorites, but not, we think, in early Earth. In green are the minerals we speculate were present in early Earth, but not in meteorites. In yellow are the ones that occur both in meteorites and early Earth. About 450 minerals in here. By the way, there is the original stellar network that I showed you at the beginning in part one. It's still embedded here, it has to be, but we just keep expanding. And we think this may be a pretty good approximation to the mineralogy of Mars. That's a hypothesis that we continue to examine and test. All right, deep breath. I wanna go into a little more detail in part seven. It's just been accepted. Um, a group of Carnegie co-authors and I put this together. And this is the evolution of the igneous minerals. And many of you will recognize that title is echoing from 100 years ago, Norman Bowen's work on the evolution of the igneous rocks. And what Bowen realized with the evidences of fractional crystallization or crystallization differentiation of magmas consist in the mineral associations and antipathies. So he's talking about the evidence that he used 100 years ago. We're doing the same thing. So we have a number of questions that we're trying to think about when we look at igneous rocks. Do minor elements display the same fractionation of trends that Bowen found for the major elements? Can we extract phase relationships from these coexistence, the associations and the antipathies? Can we distinguish melt evolution by fractionation differentiation from immiscibility? Is there a way to do that? And have igneous rocks on Earth evolved through deep time? So these are some of the questions we focused on. What we did was to survey the modes, that is the mineral contents, of 1,850 igneous rocks, identified 115 minerals, sort of the commonest primary minerals in igneous rocks, and then analyzed, used various techniques of informatics to look for patterns of coexistence, network, Louvain community detection, and so forth. So this is, again, this is months of work, is going in and sort of looking page by page through Johansson's great uh, petrography of the igneous rocks from the 1930s, extracting the nodes, also extracting nodes from the Woolley et al.'s four volume alkaline rocks and carbonatites of the world. And so these plus other sources gave us about 1,850 rocks. So here's a spreadsheet with 1,850 rows, each a different rock and 115 columns. Those are the minerals that occur and coexist. So think about a rock, it has a coexisting minerals and that's like a social network. And so here's the very first network diagram we ever did. This is back in 2016, working with our colleagues at RPI. In this case, it was just 37 common igneous minerals taken out of Harker's Petrology for Students. And what you see, each of these 37 circles is a different mineral in an igneous rock and the lines show coexistence. So for example, there's a granite, there's an olivine basalt, there's an ethylene cyanide, all the common rock types are embedded in this diagram. Fast forward to our recent study now in press, and here's 115 igneous minerals, again, showing the co-occurrences. But there's a couple of differences here. One, you'll notice it's colored, and that's because we've used Louvain community detection. So what this means basically is every one of these minerals is associated with a number of other minerals in this network. But some associations are closer than others. Just like in this room, we have a group of astronomers, we have high pressure researchers, we have data scientists. And if you look at our email patterns for the last month, how many we've communicated with different people, you'll see that there's tight knit groups and there's more loosely knit groups. And you can use Louvain community detection to see which minerals are most closely associated with each other. There is no constraint here at all in the number of communities. There could have been a hundred communities, there could have been one community. But what we find over and over again is exactly four main communities. And that's an interesting finding. No constraint, but four merge with an additional two here. Those are alkali carbonatites, the Oldono, uh, Lengai, Volcano, very ephemeral, 
only one known locality, so it's kind of a special case. So here, just like I showed before, are different rock types. Here's a muscovite granite. There's a nepheline cyanite. Here's an olivine gabbro. Here's a calcite carbonatite. This time, more complicated, it includes the accessory minerals yeah, as well. Now, by their very nature, this network has to incorporate every rock assemblage that we have. Every phase diagram has to be in here. Every reaction series of the kind that Bowen talked about, as well as things that have maybe not been discovered yet, because we're looking at a very high dimensional chemical system here. So here's the same map with all the different minerals labeled. And let me just walk you through this. The community down here, very tightly clustered, are granites, including granite pegmatites, quite distinct from mafic and ultramafic rocks up here. This break here, I think, is very much analogous to the daily gap, as it's called, very few intermediate rock types. And then we have up in the upper right hand corner, those are the alkaline igneous series, minerals, um, the feldspathoid minerals are included there, low silica content very distinct from the carbonatites. So these are minerals that include carbonate minerals. So there's some mineralogical distinctions here, but I still was very surprised to see the four communities. So what we did, we have 115 columns. We have 1,850 rows. One thing you need to do is determine how strong the links are between any two minerals. And that relates to how many times the two minerals occur together. So this is a matrix, 115 by 115 half matrix, in which we list the number of occurrences. So adrene and adrene augite occur 521 times in our list. Albite occurs 543 and so forth. Adrene and albite coexist 141 times in this list. So that's a number. We need to convert that to a percentage for our graphical work. So here is another half matrix, 115 by 115, in which the numbers are percentages. 100% of adrene occurs with adrene, 100% of albite and so forth. So the diagonal is 100. But the off diagonal elements tells you the percentage of the rare mineral that occurs with a common one. And that's then going to be a sliding scale that allows us to say whether two minerals are linked or not in the network. So what I'm gonna show you now is a little movie, but just to prepare you, there's a vernier at the bottom. This is the edge weight threshold. And what you'll see is up to 49%, every mineral is still part of the network. But if you get above 50%, minerals start breaking off because they're no longer connected to any other mineral 50% of the time. We'll also see that you can change the attributes of the nodes, you can also search for individual minerals. So there's a huge amount of exploration possible in this interacted graph, which is online. So here's the movie. We're now sliding the vernier, 39, 40. We're gonna get just about 49%. And then suddenly you start seeing some minerals lost. So you still see the community structure though, very well defined. Now I'm gonna show you movie as we slide the vernier even farther and more and more minerals get disassociated with this graph. So only the strongest linkages will be remaining as we go to higher and higher thresholds. That's the percentage. And here we are now at 78%. Turns out the Garnet community is still very, very strongly clustered, but it's only tenuously linked to the ultramafix, the alkaline rocks, and up there in the corner and off the screen are the carbonatites. But the community cluster, those four clusters still are very strongly shown. Now, let's go back and do a couple other things. You can search for individual minerals. So type in, in this case, Bertrandite. And there's Bertrandite. You can click on that mineral. You can see what it's linked to and how strongly. This is a 34% strength in terms of the bonds. You can also change here. Now I've changed from centrality node to a metric abundance. And you'll see they're two really large Nodes, that's uh, fluorapatite, and there's magnetite, and they're both linked to almost everything. And the fact that they're linked to almost everything actually distorts this graph in a way because it provides a glue that pulls everything together. So the next thing we asked is what happens if we remove the 24 
most common minerals. Most of these are the major rock forming minerals and igneous rocks. So here we see now, we've now only got 91 mostly accessory minerals. Do the same Louvain community detection and the exact same communities pop up. This is not required by the method. It just happens. You still have granite. It's widely separated from the ultramafic mafic community. You have carbonatites and it's widely separated from all the alkaline series rocks up at the top. And in this case, if we change the vernier, you start losing nodes at 25%. You see it's breaking apart, but look at how the different communities are getting farther and farther apart from each other. Once again, you see very discrete communities with the accessory minerals. Uh-oh. I think I broke the system with my movies. So, so what we're seeing here is an attribute of igneous minerals and igneous rocks that, that at least I was unaware of and the people I've talked to aren't aware of. That is the idea that there are these four discrete communities. And that as you look at the mineralogy, and especially as you make more and more stringent criteria, you really see these four discrete groups. And we suggest that indicates there may be four separate lineages of igneous magmas evolving. There's been a long-term question, for example, are carbonatites part of a continuous alkaline series? Where when you have alkaline igneous complexes, you have an outer rim of the this feldspar rich, and then you get more feldspathoids and you get less and less silica. And at the core, you often find a carbonatite. And is that just a continuous reaction series? And at least in terms of what we're seeing here, it looks like there's really a distinct set of minerals, a distinct set of elements that occurs, which suggests perhaps an immiscible fluid. There's also very strong gaps, the daily gap, as I mentioned, where you have mafic and ultramafic rocks with a continuous variation of silica content. But then it seems like a very large gap where there are very few intermediate rocks and the granitic rocks that are more high in silica seem to be also a separate group. I told you these movies will break things. Okay. Yay, we're back, we're back, we're back. Okay, I wanna show you one other way of representing this. And this is a completely different way of separating out different communities. It's called agglomative clustering. It's a hierarchical approach, which is very different from Louvain community detection. It says which two minerals are most closely associated and what's the next and what's the next and what's the next. And when you do this with 115 minerals, so this is a matrix 115 by 115 you start seeing very, very strong communities. And it's the exact same four communities, even though we've done this in a completely mathematically different way. You see the granitic series, alkaline, carbonatite, and mafic, with a couple other small clusters that just contain two minerals each. And you look in detail, here's the granitic cluster. The bright colors mean that those two minerals are associated more often. It's the same group of minerals we found in the granitic cluster before. Here's the carbonatite series, the same group of minerals we found before. And you also, with this technique, can start seeing what Bowen called antipathies, minerals that never occur together, things that are sort of the negative part of a network, if you will. And yet here's a whole box of minerals where it's almost black with almost no corresponding minerals. I've blown that up. And look at this upper corner. These are some of the minerals in granitic rocks versus ultramafic rocks. And, and maybe this isn't a huge surprise to you, but in terms of the, the accessory minerals, the minor minerals, which are often not discussed in the major petrology work, um, there's almost no overlap at all. Now we can basically do this again with an interactive graphic. So what I'm gonna show you is each of those squares, you can click on it and see the value of the co-occurrence and other trends. So here's a movie where I'm just clicking around. You can see those are very high numbers of in the 90s, many of them. But if we come down to this black area and they're all zero, no correlation whatsoever, no, no, no association whatsoever. You can also pull out subsets. This is all interactive graphics that are online. You can look at subsets and really get into the details. Because of course, with 115 by 115 matrix, there's a lot of data there. Okay, so. What I'm hoping to show you there is that this, this trend of having four different communities with very strong associations amongst the communities, but real strong antipathies outside the communities is something we haven't seen before in the discussion of igneous petrology. 
Let's quickly go through the chronology of igneous lithologies. Um, the earliest igneous rocks on Earth were ultramafics, mafic lithologies, quartz, silica bearing rocks that are formed by the partial melting of basalt probably came within a few tens of millions of years after that. So those are both very early, but the earliest alkaline igneous series is only about 3.2 of what's known. And the earliest complex pegmatite, carbonatites, agpietic pegmatites, those are all about 3 billion years old and none are known older than that. But the really strange thing is there seem to have been no new igneous lithologies of any kind in the last 3 billion years. I'm not sure what that's telling us. So here's some of our conclusions of the igneous. This is part seven of the evolutionary series. We see four strong communities and both the major elements and the minor elements and accessory minerals show the same four communities. Igneous rocks display classic features of an evolving system. We see increased complexity, mineral diversity over the first 1.5 billion years of Earth's history. But the last 3 billion years have seen very little change in this and no major new groups in the last 3 billion years. That's a surprise also. I'll just give you a hint. Part eight is in preparation. This is metamorphic minerals. So we, I surveyed 2,400 metamorphic rocks, 92 common minerals. This is a subset graph of that. These are what are called the metapelites, that is med mudstones that have been subjected to high temperature and high pressure. There's a very strong temperature axis and a pressure axis, which almost exactly overlaps the classic textbook illustration of Barovian metamorphism. And we'll be able in our paper to superimpose one of these on the other. And the mineralogy follows because there is a temperature axis and a pressure axis. So that's kind of cool. That's part eight. Um, let me just end by talking a little bit about the paragenetic modes again. Remember, we did this study of paragenetic modes. We surveyed 5,700 minerals. We had 57 different paragenetic modes. Saw lots of combinations. This is what the data looked like. This took months. And we were able to make, this is the first network graph. It's just an extension of what you've already seen, but it's the first network graph of all of mineralogy, 5,700 minerals and little brown nodes. 57 nodes representing different ways that minerals form. Every node is connected to one or more mineral, every mineral to one or more paragenetic modes. You'll see these beautiful sprays of minerals, minerals that form in only one way, but lots of other minerals that form in multiple ways, forming the middle of this graph. And we've learned some really interesting trends in all of mineralogy. The first one, which I guess didn't surprise me, but still the numbers did, more than 80% and probably closer to 90% of all minerals form through some kind of fluid rock interaction, water rock interaction. So you need an active hydrosphere to get real mineral diversity. The second, biology plays a major role. More than half of all minerals form through biological processes and more than a third are only known to form through some kind of biological mediation. Another discovery has to do with the importance of rare chemical elements. So imagine there are 41 elements that collectively represent only one in 10,000 atoms, 0.01%, 100 of a percent of all crustal atoms are these rare earth elements, platinum group elements, arsenic, molybdenum, tin, lithium, boron, beryllium, and so forth. You add those collectively. And yet collectively, they are essential in 42% of all mineral species known. So 100th of 1% of the elements on earth play an essential role in forming 42% of all the minerals. And I think that that actually goes back to this idea of fluid rock interactions because your fluid rock interactions create concentrated solutions that are transported and then deposited. So you can concentrate uranium, you can concentrate molybdenum, you can concentrate the platinum group elements and therefore have localized mineral deposits even though the average compositions are very, very low. 59% of the minerals are only known to form in one way. Another 24% form in two different ways. So that means more than 80% of all minerals are rare and only form in very specialized environments. But pyrite has 21 formation modes. That's the record. And finally, this is just a hypothesis, but one that we're looking at very closely because we're comparing networks of minerals to those of molecules to those of atmospheric molecules. And the structure of a network like this may in fact be a biosignature. The, the, the arrangement here where the biological minerals are strongly partitioned 
into the right side of the diagram is something we want to explore more to see if mineral distributions themselves are a planetary scale by a signature. Okay, my concluding remarks. First, just an observation. Nothing that I've shown you today involved measuring new data, making new observations, taking new samples. We've used old data, in many cases, data more than half a century old. And that's one of the keys of data science. We can repurpose old data in new ways. All these efforts, efforts are the very, very beginning of explorations. Virtually everything I've shown you are publications from 2020 or more recently. So we just started, I see decades of work ahead to really refine this. I also wanna emphasize the, these methods of informatics are not exclusive to mineralogy by any means. If you have large amounts of data in geochemistry, in astronomy, in experimental petrology, whatever, these methods, cluster analysis, machine learning, network analysis, association analysis, they're all applicable um, because as our dear late colleague, Peter Fox said, data are data. None of this would have been possible without our associations with RPI and Peter Fox's group. And he died tragically much, much too young. We had many, many years of work ahead of us, but his students are carrying on. So this is my conclusion. With that, I thank you. Hope there will be time for some more hard questions. I'd like to kick off with one quick question and then we'll get to everybody else. Um, so it occurred to me while you were wrapping up there, do we have enough data from lunar samples to do the same thing for lunar rocks, given that you don't have life and presumably no hydrothermal activity, mm -hmm. so it should be a much simpler system? Mm -hmm. Is that something that can be done? It's a really important question. This is Shauna Morrison's specialty. She's building databases of lunar, of Mars, of Vesta based on the HED meteorites and looking for patterns. And clearly we don't have enough information yet. So we're continuing to explore, but our inventories of minerals from those worlds are growing. And yet there are very few surprises. I think earth is surprising because it's so diverse and because mm -hmm. it has this hydrosphere and has biology. And so I think that in terms of the stages of mineral evolution, those other worlds are probably frozen in about what we call stage three, and Earth's going all the way to stage 10. Okay, thank you. Francesca, did you still want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna ask you, this was very interesting. When you were mentioning for the curve that you showed at the beginning where we all start asking you question, where there was a bump and you were like, we are the only one that can uh, have this data reproduction because the, we are the only one that have samples that are so old. So are you saying that what you observe with your like machine uh, learning techniques could have easily been observed just by the samples? And so your way gives just a statistical sort of um, uh, robustness to your observation, or is it something that you could have not seen with samples? Well, certainly people have seen trends through time with mineral samples and, and other samples as well. And that was what, people have done for, for several decades now, for example, with redox sensitive minerals. But the trouble is you're just looking at like one or two parameters and trying to model some complex earth process through deep time. What we suggest is that those complex earth processes like changes in atmospheric composition are the result of many, many variables, which we don't necessarily even know what all of them are, but if you get all the information you can from samples from say three billion years or three and a half billion years, that there's going to be some record buried in those numbers that we're gonna see correlations at higher dimensions that we can't immediately see just by looking at those data tables that I've shown you. I mean, okay. it's just impossible to look at a data table, for example, and say, oh, here's, here's a universal trend about minerals. But when you apply these techniques, the trends in higher dimensions fall out. I see. Okay, thanks. And I have another question. This is my, maybe more on perspective, but so now you're basing your machine learning techniques on things that you can observe. So you were mentioning also like carbons from pre-solar grain and so on. How far, how far in time should we go to be able to predict mineral that we don't observe at all, but might be out there 
and we don't have the right condition. Like I've seen in one of your paper, you were mentioning this long list of carbides that right, are right, supposed right, to right. exist, but we can't yeah. see. So would machine learning be a way to predict? Absolutely. So that's another whole, this is a field of mineral ecology that our group has worked on where we predict not only how many minerals are missing through, through a typical biological process of doing an accumulation curve, where the more you discover, the fewer things are left and there's your asymptotically going. But we can actually make specific predictions about what minerals are missing. And we've done that for carbon minerals. We predicted several minerals that were subsequently found um, after a systematic search for those minerals. We said, go to this locality and you should be able to find this mineral that's never been described. But that's, that's again, I mean, this is very much like association analysis is just um, using statistical analysis of large numbers of things that are known to predict where we're going for things that aren't known. So um, this kind of builds on Francesca's first question, but also gets to your point about ultimately the reason we're doing this is to try to get back to insight or theory. Practically speaking, how do you avoid getting so far into, you said sort of a set of factors that are unknown or multi-dimension where it's almost impossible to come back? It, where is that boundary and how do, you, how do you back out from that something here to, okay, what are the pieces or what is the process? Yeah, this, this is a real uh, perplexing problem. We're talking about seeing correlations in higher dimensions that we may not at first be able to explain or understand or using machine learning, which comes up with an algorithm, which you can't put down on paper. Here's this nice trend between pressure and garnet composition, but we can't actually write an equation in any normal form. And part of this in, involves advances needed in the data science itself. That's why we have to work very closely with the top people in data science because they're working on making those resolutions. You also have to have disciplinary scientists who have a lot of insight about their systems. You can say, oh, gee, that's interesting. You know, We see this correlation with uranium, chromium, and manganese, and that seems to be impacting a particular inflection point in a way that earth changed. And then you come up with a hypothesis, but this is not traditional induction or deduction. It's actually a field called abduction, where you assume that a higher dimensional data set has correlations, which you're not gonna be able to see just by looking at the data. And yet the correlations are there. And once you find that correlation, it's gonna reveal something that you just simply couldn't have learned without that higher dimensional analysis. Well, so just quick follow-up. So, I mean, abduction, but also faith that your underlying data set or your approach, you have to trust that that's <laughs> real and that it can, then I, I guess that's what I'm asking is, you know, how do you avoid going down a rabbit hole? <laughs> that, or do, is that just, Inherent in this approach. That's why datafication is so absolutely critical. This, that middle step where you're basically taking the observations and the measurements that people have made over decades, over centuries in some case, and creating a data resource where you have intuition. These are the attributes that are important. These are the ways that they've been measured that are accurate and, and trustworthy. The ages, if you go to our mineral evolution database, there are, you know, those data each line of that 200,000 is, is like 200 different columns because we have all these different metadata, how it was measured, when it was measured, whether it was measured on an adjacent mineral or on an adjacent rock or the actual mineral. I mean, all this, you have to have that detail. So you need experts building these databases. You can't just do it blindly. Um, and I think that our mineral databases, the, the rough database, the MINDAT database are really, uh, there, there's a lot of scrutiny and curation that are going on with those, but that's, that's absolutely critical. And, and it's always going to be true. It's just a comment first about, I mean, I think your question is so fundamental to all of artificial intelligence and data analysis is what, you know, can you actually extract basic models that can predict? Um, so I have a related question, which is um, given, I mean, of course, earth is the place you're going to always have the most information and you have, it's really impressive the amount of data you've collected. Um, you, you showed, I guess the question is, what would be the minimum sort of set of minerals that you would need to start saying, oh, there is life on this planet. So, <laughs> so you, you know, you show some of these minerals have high correlation with many others, right? You pulled them out and you showed what happened and you pulled them out. 
you know, if you were, if you were looking back at Earth and were able to collect all this data, what would you say? Okay, there is likely instead of just saying, "Oh, there's CO two and there's water in the atmosphere," what would you what would you say would give you some level of of confidence that you could start saying, "Well, there may be uh, this this coevolution or something else more than just uh, you know." Rocks. So I think what's most likely to show that is a group of minerals that are in close association but are not in equilibrium that show a wide range of redox state or some other chemical gradient that implies that there has been some local process that creates these gradients. And that's something that life does extremely well. And so once you see that, for example, if you see methane and oxygen in the atmosphere at the same time, to maintain that, you either have to have some mic and address this better than I can, but you either have to have some ongoing geological process that's generating two different fluxes, or you have living systems that are doing it. Um, and I think that's the kind of mineralogical evidence that I'd be more comfortable with, rather than saying any one mineral or, or few minerals is the, that's the smoking gun for life. But it's almost hopeless. I mean, in some ways you'll never mm. have this kind of data anywhere else. Down the road, <laughs> colonies on Mars, you know, who maybe, else is it? Maybe the moon, maybe the moon. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah, no, that's true. Remote sensing is not going to do it for an exoplanet. We have an online question. Hey, uh, Bob, can you hear me okay? Louder. <laughs> uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, Steve Shirey here. Um, thank you for an expansive talk. I want to return to the question um, posed by your, your igneous rock uh, database, uh, the mineralogy associations there. Bowen uh, sort of famously ignored melting. He didn't completely ignore it, but he really focused on liquid line of descent and crystals and magmas. Um, but your five groups of, of igneous uh, mineral associations really strike me as coming from melting, of course, because uh, that's how igneous rocks form. And, and so the source characteristics that control uh, what kind of composition melts is really what sets the five five groups apart. So have you thought about how to use this approach to uh, get to the question of, of, of the source composition for igneous rocks? It would also apply to detrital mineral associations as well in igneous rock, in, in sedimentary rocks. Steve, that's a great question. We thought about it, but what we decided is that none of us at Carnegie right now, or we should bring you into this discussion, um, I know exactly how to move forward with this. So we're going to have a group that includes uh, um, John Blundy and, and Mark Giorso and Jay Agu. Um, we're going to have a workshop here coming up this winter um, to address exactly these questions. What are we seeing here? What information can we extract from these mineral coexistence data that might be telling us something more about melt evolution and the co-relationships of these different minerals? Also extracting phase diagrams for rare elements in igneous systems where we can actually extract potentially, you know, eight, 10, 12 component system phase diagrams, uh, which just experimentally are beyond any sort of easy way of doing it right now. Right. Great. I'm looking forward to that workshop. It, it, it'll be open, right? Oh yeah. Great. Mike Walters Thanks. in charge of that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah. Just quick. I wanted to follow up uh, on, first of all, on, uh, some of the questions that we've had already, uh, particularly Diana. It seems to me if you have non, if you're doing nonlinear least squares fitting, you can always get a better uh, fit to the data if you have more parameters. Mm -hmm. So what's not clear to me, in, for instance, in your in your Garnet thing, is how many parameters did you have in those fits uh, to to get a nice linear regression? Can I turn that question to Anirudh? Because I was not an author on that study. All right. I'm just really impressed with the study because it shows the kind of things that machine learning can do. But, but okay, you're absolutely but that's correct. not my main question, but yeah. That, uh, uh, so there's, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, there's nine uh, parameters there. And we used, essentially started with all nine. Can you repeat your question again? What, 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 basically I'm asking what is the statistical significance of your reduced chi squares fit. Mm. You know, so you take into account the number of three parameters you put into your fit. So yeah, so essentially what we did was we ran a random forest regression. So we didn't do like a particular distribution fit at all. Uh, what we did was the method uses, essentially you put in all of the nine compositional parameters and then you create decision trees 
and then you essentially then choose randomly what a different kinds of decision trees to make your prediction. So what you do is you look at all the possible parameters and all the distributions that occur between that, which is not a chi-squared fit or any kind of singular fit, where it is actually a mixed model fit, which shows multiple complex uh, distributions, which is a combination of individual Gaussian or chi-squared fits. So essentially what we're trying to do is not trying to fit it to any single function, but to simply have the data, uh, simply have the algorithm look at the kind of data and the distribution there is to then figure out what are the multi-dimensional fits that happen, which essentially happens to be a combination of three different Gaussian fits, so a Gaussian mixture model. So we don't, uh, what I try not to do is to have it fit a singular function and then say, you know, this is the function that fits so well or doesn't fit and let the data decide that. So. Was that helpful, or so, you have more questions? Sort of. It still doesn't tell me. Is the is the is the fit the ultimate fit that you come up with statistically significant, or have you got so many free parameters in your model that you could fit any data set? Um, so it's it, there is a statistical significance there, and we're using okay. uh, Gini mini uh, Gini mini decrease as a statistical significance metric. Okay. Uh, for it, we are not looking for. And this is why because sorry, this is why because it's a nonlinear model, uh, I'm not looking for R squared fits or any other traditional use fits, but uh, it, the Gini mini decrease is an established method of finding out how statistically significant uh, a particular model is based on the RMSC values that they show. And so that's why instead of comparing it with um, R squared fit or any other kind of fit, we're looking at, you know, how much is the error value or how little is the error value compared to previous uh, established methods? That was not my main question. So, yeah. I, I wonder which... Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. My, my, my main question is how do you deal with biases in your data, particularly when you're looking at evolution? So there can be biases in, in uh, in the petrology that goes into the data, the biases in the type of rocks that different geologists will study. Uh, and then there's the bio, bio, biases due to preservation. And the further you go back in time, the less preservation you have of the original rocks. And so one could imagine that you have an apparent evolution in your minerals uh, as you go back in time. And, but that's not evolution. It's just telling you how well preserved certain types of rocks are mm -hmm. uh, as, you, uh, as you go back in time. Uh, and, so it's, and particularly, there's also when, uh, most, the fact that most of your manganese minerals are, are forming at plate margins. Is that really demonstrating a diversity, a diversity problem? Or is it just that these are the types of rocks that you're going to actually preserve in mountains uh, for uh, in mountain building areas for long periods of time. So you're asking exactly the questions that we ask. One of the things we found, for example, in other analyses of our data is that the hardness, the average hardness of minerals um, decreases over the last 3 billion years. That is 3 billion year old minerals are harder on average than modern minerals. That's because they preserve more. So we know that there are biases. We know there are biases because when you have a tectonic event that forms a mountain range, you not only preferentially make minerals, but you preferentially preserve them. So these are all biases that are incorporated. Now, and so there are biases that are going to be part of every data set, especially a deep time data set. What's remarkable to me is that using many, many attributes of various deposits over time, that you can see these trends. So what I'm assuming, since they're trained on some of our constraints, we know that atmospheric oxygen was extremely low 4 billion years ago. We know that what atmospheric oxygen is today. And we also have other benchmarks. Since we know that, that it will basically ignore the variables in the mineral record. There are those preservational biases and it will emphasize the things that are preserved that are telling us something about atmospheric oxygen. Now, you can debate that, but that's the strategy that goes into every one of these machine learning types of, of efforts that you basically have a whole group of data and you say, if you're searching for a particular parameter and you have a training set that you're confident about, 
you know that certain garnet compositions come from certain pressures, that that training set will cause the final algorithm to ignore the biases that aren't related to pressure versus composition. That's, I think we all need a tutorial in machine learning. We just talked about that this morning because I, I find some of this a very much a black box as well. And there are many, when I say machine learning or that, that means many, many different things. There, it's a whole toolkit, a whole set of approaches, but they're incredibly powerful. You wanna look at higher dimensional systems. And the only way we're gonna understand earth is a complex system. And I absolutely believe this, that you're looking at a planet that's incredibly complex. So all sorts of interacting um, chemical and physical processes and biological processes. The only way we're ever gonna understand it is to treat it as a complex system with many interacting variables, not as X, Y plots. Okay, I think we'll wrap up there. Let's thank Bob again. You can keep the discussion going over lunch.